good evening everyone welcome to the third series of these master classes brought to you by the academic council of indian association of surgical oncology today is the inaugural session of this academic calendar year of 2023 i invite our president dr p k das to kindly deliver the welcome address for today's webinar sir good evening i welcome you all for this uh, uh series 3 chapter 42 of iso master class so at the outset let me thank and uh, welcome our senior members past presidents and uh, uh the journal advisors of this uh, master class council dr sanjeev misra dr arnab gupta dr sada shivam and dr raj govind sharma who has given their kind consent to participate as a journal advisor and council members for the academic council 2023 so my whole hearted uh, appreciation and regards to dr subramanish rao dr srijan shukla and his team for giving a very good platform over last two years and uh, giving a uh, opportunity to most of the academicians of this iso uh, membership group including youngsters and pg students which has helped them in a great way so i welcome you sir again for this uh, coming year i also welcome both the examiners dr rajiv sarin from mumbai and dr dipendra sarkar from kolkata who gave their kind consent to become the examiner for this inaugural uh, section and uh, inaugural uh, session of chapter of 42 uh, to be the examiners and uh, i also uh, welcome the examiners dr karan kale and dr priyan sijer so lastly it is my pleasure to welcome all the ec members of iso and participants who has attended this uh, meeting and uh, without wasting time i should hand over the uh, next session to dr rao to start this thank you thank you uh, dr das now i invite our convener dr sponesh rao to give a brief introduction of uh, our faculty today i think it's, it's a great privilege and uh, pleasure to introduce uh, dr rajiv sarin he is a clinician and scientist working at tata memorial hospital and actor in mumbai he was trained at tata memorial hospital mumbai and royal marsden hospital london he is in charge of the cancer genetics <laughs> unit and uh, he is a professor of radiation oncology focusing on breast cancer convener to the breast cancer disease management group at tmh He established the first cancer genetics unit in the country in 2003. Leads the ICMR Center for Advanced Research in Cancer Genetics and Genomics. Co-investigator, principal investigator of the International Cancer Genome Consortium, India Project on Oral Cancer. Chairperson ICMR Committee for National Guidelines for Breast Cancer. Chairperson for major cancer committees and task forces on cancer research by major government funding bodies like the ICMR, DST, and DBT. what i would want to tell about sarin sarin is an inspirational character <clears throat> been a major influence in bringing in genetics into into cancer care this is not something that that every anybody and everybody would accept i i i, I could find such resistance in the institute uh, i took about 4 years to ask somebody to look after genetics so he he has pioneered it and he he gets the credit for showing the country that a clinician steps aside from the the hardcore uh, clinical uh, uh, activity to work full time in in genetics which is extremely important so really appreciate his presence uh, uh, in in this uh, component of cancer care and uh, all of us know he is a is a he is a absolute authority and he speaks well welcome dr rajiv sir thank you very much thank you very much for your kind words 
Deep Tendra is a, is a complete surgical oncologist with a special interest in breast. He has occupied multiple positions. He has been a leader all through. I've known him for, for the past uh, uh, two decades. A uh, great teacher. And uh, he, he's a clinical and research lead of breast service uh, in IPGMER, Kolkata. Visiting Hawk Professor, Mayo Clinic, US. International Surgical Tutor in the Royal College of Edinburgh. Expert National Breast Cancer Screening Program. International Resource Person, Early Diagnosis, uh, BC, Bangladesh. Past President of ABSI. Honorary Secretary, Asian Society of Mastology. Editor in Chief, Annals of Breast Diseases. So if you talk about breast, you, you cannot miss Deep Nanda Sarkar. A great teacher and a, and a wonderful human being. Welcome, Dr. Deep, Deep Nanda. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rao, it's for those kind words. Hope to have a wonderful evening today. The examinees for today are Dr. Karan Kale, who is a resident in the Department of Surgical Oncology at Madhuri Medical College, and Dr. Priyansh Jain, who is also a resident in the Department of Surgical Oncology at Ames Bhupaneshwar. We'll be having three sessions today. The first would be a clinical case discussion, which would be in the form of a mock exam. Uh, we have a few housekeeping instructions for the session to our participants. To our examinees, uh, we request you to give to the point answers to the questions being asked. Uh, no one is ever expected to know all the answers, so there's no harm if you don't know something because it saves us time and it maintains the flow of this webinar uh, uh, meeting. And uh, our examiners in the past uh, have had a habit of giving hints, so it's up to you to catch them in time. To our dear moderator, uh, uh, we request you to please address the examinee by their name uh, to avoid any confusion as to who's supposed to answer. Uh, it will ensure that there's less uh, uh, time in between uh, the questions and answers. And we also uh, request you to ensure that both get equal opportunity to participate. Uh, to examiners, both the moderator and uh, Dr. Sarin today, in interest of online viewers, both who are present today live, as well as people who are viewing this at a later date on YouTube, uh, we request you to give the expected answers to the questions that remain unanswered or have been incorrectly answered by the students. In this way, this will not be an examination, uh, but a webinar. For the online participants who are live, uh, we sincerely thank the C senior ISO members who have joined in. We uh, highly regard uh, your inputs as well, and we would love to hear about them in the chat box. And for the other residents, uh, this is a very unique opportunity to clear all your doubts regarding this subject. Regarding the timekeeping, the first session would be 45 minutes. At 30 minutes, I'll be giving a small reminder to the moderator on the chat box. Uh, and at the conclusion, at 45 minutes, I'll again give a reminder to Dr. Ditendra on the chat box. I won't be interrupting. Uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Ditendra Sarkar, and all the best to the examinees. Uh, good evening uh, to everyone and uh, we are going to take you through to two distinct case capsules and as Sijan has rightly pointed out it's not a, it's a mock exam but it's more of a learning experience for all of us and I welcome Priyansh and Karan as well. Good, and, evening, uh, good, evening. good evening. Now we go to the first case. <laughs> now this is capsule one. This is about a uh, just a minute, I will. This is about a 37 years female who presented with a four cross four centimeter progressive lump in her right breast for six months. She does not give any history of any nipple discharge, breast or any lump in her ipsilateral or contralateral breast. There are no features which are suggestive of systemic metastasis. Her maternal aunt had a breast cancer and on examination, clinical examination of the breast, there was again a four cross four centimeter lower outer quadrant farm lump, which is fixed to the breast tissue, but free from the overlying skin and the underlying structures. And uh, uh, I will go with Karan first. Uh, uh, did you get the brief history that I presented just now? Yes, sir. Okay, now this is the radiology and uh, 
you understand I'm, this is not a radiology class, but it's quite obvious from the ultrasound and the mammogram that has been done. Uh, it shows that it's a BIRAD 4C lesion with all the features which are suggestive of a possible breast cancer. And she underwent a core biopsy, which shows invasive breast cancer, and the immunohistochemistry was triple negative with CHI-67 around 40%. Now, I will start with Karan first. And Karan, uh, yes. looking at this particular patient that we had, which is in the late 30s, so what other investigations will you like to recommend in this particular patient? Sir, as this uh, lady is uh, at the age of 37, sir. So, yeah. uh, so she is uh, uh, likely of uh, having uh, hereditary breast cancer, sir. So, along with this, uh, the opposite breast also, I would like to screen, sir. The image which I have got is of uh, only one uh, epsilateral breast, sir. So, contractor breast mammogram will be my other, uh, other investigation which I will do, sir. And also, yeah, I mean, this patient actually undergone bilateral. I just focused it on the unilateral side. Okay, done. So, mammogram, both breast and ultrasound, done, and axilla as well. And then, yes, sir. Now, apart from this, uh, my second important investigation will be to rule out uh, hereditary breast cancer, sir, because patient is uh, already having a second degree relative of uh, breast cancer, sir. And also, patient itself uh, is having a age of less than 37, both are meeting the criteria to uh, go for genetic testing, sir. Okay. So, uh, what genetic testing would you recommend for this lady? Sir, uh, uh, first I will uh, uh, test for that uh, affected lady, sir. That is the, her aunt I will check, sir. Because uh, affected individual should be tested first. And mm -hmm. I will test for, uh, mostly for multigenesis, sir. Because we don't know what uh, say she's having, uh, what gene mutations she's having, sir. Okay, so let, let us take this question to Priyansh. Now, Priyansh, what yes, is your take on, uh, are you going to do for a, a, a comprehensive gene panel or focus on BRCA1 and BRCA2, considering this young lady who is 37 years and has aunt, second degree relative aunt who had a breast cancer? Are you, what will be your take? Karan told he wants a, a comprehensive uh, gene testing. What's your take? Sir, I would also like to have a comprehensive gene testing, sir. Okay, and what's your rationale for that? Sir, rationale for that is like, uh, apart from BRCA mutation, we also have significant other genetic mutation. We can also present with increased risk of breast cancer. And the guidelines, the FC current and the ESCO guidelines also do recommend that comprehensive gene panels should, should be tested for the index case. So, Dr. Sarin, I will go to you. Uh, what is your uh, take on this? Would you recommend that one? These they are perfectly all uh, correct by doing uh, a, a comprehensive, or they should focus on BRCA one and BRCA two? Okay, so I think before that, I would like to ask these examinees: Are there any things in the personal, you know, history or the family history of examination findings which could suggest? that it may not be because of BRCA1 or BRCA2, but because of some other syndromes, uh, because that would definitely lead you to do that. So, no, sir. Uh, no? no. So, sir. Uh, this lady, she, now what you were told that her maternal aunt uh, had breast cancer. Yes, sir. Do you know, would you want to know what, at what age she had breast cancer? Suppose the maternal aunt had breast cancer at the age of 78. Would that be more relevant or the breast or the maternal aunt died of breast cancer when she was 29? Yes, sir. It's probably both, isn't it? So for relevant will be uh, relative with the uh, diagnosis of malignancy less than 50 years. That will be more relevant for us. Sir. I mean, 50 is arbitrary. So the age at which the relative had breast cancer or whichever cancer uh, she had. And then what about her mother? Maybe her mother is 89 and she is absolutely fine. So normally then what would that uh, make you think? I'm just going by history before we come to genetic testing. Family history. Because it all starts with that. So the maternal aunt has a breast cancer. And if the mother is not giving any history of breast cancer, she might be just a, a carrier of that mutation. 
So we need to have an extensive pedigree chart before we think about the genetic syndrome. So you make the take a detailed family history, not just of the uh, affected people at what age they got cancer. And if possible, to know what type of cancer. Now, how can you guess what type of cancer the suppose the maternal aunt had? And this lady is in quite close contact with a maternal aunt. From your history, can you judge what type of cancer her maternal aunt would have had? Yes, sir. From the sequence of treatment which she underwent, we can okay. have a lot of guess of what kind of cancer like she had. Like what? What's the like, like we first asked, like what was the sequence? Whether the chemotherapy was given was followed by surgery. Did she took any hormonal therapy or any uh, costly injections that were given for one year? From such history, we can make out what kind of molecule. Especially if they were told that for five years or ten years, my auntie used to take the tablet hormone treatment, then you know it was ER positive. Okay, that is that is one thing. So you know the age of which her maternal aunt had cancer and whether it was receptor positive or not. Just from the history, yeah. you you will be able to uh, get this. Okay, so this is for her the family history. Now, anything in her personal examination when you examine her could give you a clue that this could be due to some other gene, if at all it is hereditary. Uh, other uh, findings like sir, uh, any other abdominal lump if she is presenting, sir, or mm -hmm. not? Yes. Uh, that is one thing. More, uh, see, some of the findings which are like very characteristic of a syndrome, underlying syndrome. Now, the question. Multiple, uh, uh, breast primaries. See, the question that was asked whether you will do only BRCA1 and 2 or a larger panel of genes. So, when you say larger panel of genes, that means other syndromes or other genes. Yes, sir. So some of the genes have very characteristic features. So, at least the ones that have a phenotypic feature, that you should be aware. That could be. You know, you may be seeing that patient and then, then you would think, uh, okay, let's look at this gene. So, are you aware of any syndrome yes, where sir. breast cancer is one of the common uh, cancer and they also have like? So, if we talk about the Cowden syndrome, Cowden syndrome. Cowden syndrome. Okay. which will present with hematomas and oral, mu oral cutaneous oral mucosal lesions. Similarly, sir, with Peutz-Zeger syndrome also, patient will have some um, yes. macular syndrome. Yes. So oh, that, so these two. So this is just two examples, and then there will be some other syndromes where there is no phenotypic feature external, but uh, there would be you know other things. So like uh, which are the other common syndrome where you can get breast cancer? Yeah, the so, like, from any syndrome. Lee from any syndrome. So that from this itself you know that just looking at BRCA one and two, although these are the most common genes, you will not get it right. So a larger panel would be helpful. So. But why sometimes only BRCA1 and 2 done? That is common practice. Okay, It's not that it is not done. Why is sometimes only BRCA1 and 2 done? Sir, uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 are uh, relatively, uh, they are present in a higher uh, patient population. Sir. That is in 1 in 400 ratio, it is present in general population. That's why so we are the most commonly mutated. Uh, commonly genes. mutated genes. Yes. Then what else? So, uh, presentation wise, uh, from pre predominantly breast uh, is the breast is the most uh, presenting symptom, and uh, predominant symptoms uh, of this BRCA mutation. Sir. So that's why BRCA and two are preferred. Okay. Is there sir, any other reason? Yes, sir. Yes, sir the to... data which we... sorry, sir. Yes, yes. Tell the me. mutation data which we have from the population study, which yes. points more towards the BRCA. So we have more data regarding the BRCA mutation. And if we test other genes, the mutations which you get, we don't know whether they are clinically relevant or not. That is true. And historically, when they were not doing GEM, NGS, they were doing by Sanger sequencing and BRCA1 and 2 were the most commonly tested genes. That was the first gene. That's why the name is BRCA1, the first gene that was found in hereditary breast ovarian cancer, then BRCA2. And of course, now you do NGS, so you test more cases. Okay. I'm, I'm done with this question. So, Dr. Okay. Sarin, so, so, so to summarize, as Dr. Sarin told to Priyansh and to uh, Karan, it's, it's necessarily you have to ask a huge lot of questions to understand whether the patient is having a cow dead or you have a leech or life from in. Uh, you have to ask this question. So that is the important message. And after that, you bang on what exactly needs to be done. Uh, now, uh, 
uh, I go to Priyansh now. Priyansh, yes, would you sir. like to have an MRI done in this particular patient, considering that the patient is a young patient, uh, 37 years, and you saw it's quite a dense breast. Are you happy with uh, the ultrasound and mammogram? Would you like to get an MRI done? Yes, sir. Even just lo looking at the mammogram images, I could see a dense area, and I was not able to make out the specific mass in the mammogram images. And there were a few micro calcifications also. Looking at the young age with the positive family history, I would have gone for MRI prior to, like, along with the clinical management. Just a passing by question, Priyans. What would be the impact of a dense breast in mammogram as relating to the higher chances or lower chances of malignancy in the in the family? Yes, sir. the dense breast with the ACR grading of D is itself a risk factor for a breast malignancy. Sir. Okay, so let's go to the MRI of this patient. So before we go to that. Now, uh, Karan, could you just summarize what is the current guidelines for BRCA testing in symptomatic individuals? Karan? Yes, sir. Yeah. What are the current guidelines for BRCA testing in symptomatic individuals? I'm not talking about an asymptomatic individual. Yes, That's the second case that we will discuss. This is a proven breast malignancy. What are the current lines, current guidelines for BRCA testing in symptomatic individuals? Sir, in the patients who are symptomatic, uh, when the patient is presenting at the age of less than 50, sir, this is one. And uh, if at all patient is presenting at the age of less than 60 years and uh, with the uh, uh, with ISC of uh, triple negative breast cancer, sir, this is the second uh, relation, sir. And uh, if at all patient is presenting with multiple primary uh, breast lesions and uh, if at all patient uh, along with having any history in the family of uh, uh, breast cancer, sir, who is the diagnosed with the age less than 50 years or patient uh, having history of uh, ovarian cancer in the family, and uh, along with male breast cancer history, sir, these are all the uh, important uh, indi indications for uh, testing. For Priyan, Priyan, would you like to add something to that? Uh, sir, the recent updates mentioned that any TNBC should, should, should be tested for the BRCA mutation and uh -huh. age less than 45. At any age? At any, age. Have, any, any age? TNBC, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, Dr. Rajiv, would you agree to this uh, statement that at any age a TNBC should have a BRCA testing done? So the guidelines vary. Some guidelines had suggested. So generally a cutoff of 60 years for TNBC is more widely accepted. And some are like, here, okay, so TNBC under the age of 60 years, uh, that is one thing. But, you know, these guidelines are sort of very broad. So what are the main thing that will you will definitely ask for uh, genetic risk assessment? If you just name one, two, three. Well, the Gale, Capro, Broca, Braca. So in the test. clinic, do you do all this? No, sir. So what say you are a clinician. So when you see a patient in the, in the clinic, okay, the patient has come and seems like an operable breast cancer. So you are a surgeon, you are doing your MCH. What are the things that if you see that you will say, okay, this patient definitely needs genetic risk assessment. If you have a genetics clinic, you will refer there. If you don't have a genetics clinic, then you will order or arrange for a genetic test and you should know. So what are the things that you would definitely do that? And what will you tell the patient? Yes, so the first criteria will be the age, sir. Any young age patient less than 45, I would consider with a significant uh, family. So every history. second or third patient that you get, uh, you are at which place, Priyansh? I forgot. Which Bhubaneshwar, center. sir. Bhubaneshwar. 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 Yeah. So what is the average age of patient in your center, breast cancer patient? Sir, uh, 48, sir. 48. That means half the patients are of this age. That means so... You know, if you go by yeah. this definition that every second patient in your practice, do you have the patient get genetic testing that becomes the top priority. So you always start with the, the most I mean, common indication Okay, where you, you will definitely not miss. If you fail to do that, then you will be found at fault. Okay. If a for under 50 years, if every patient that you do not refer, you may someone, you know, you could do it. It may be in a guideline, but. First, you tell me the patient who has the highest possibility of having a germline. 
mutation because of inherited predisposition, which you should definitely so so first, any first degree relative with the history of breast cancer. So you say strong family history. So personal history of breast cancer and a strong family history, personal and strong family history. Okay. Then in absence of family history, then what are the other features? So a lady says, no, no one in my family had uh, any cancer. Then what are the other features which will you make you strongly suspect that there could be an underlying, uh, you know, inheritance, inherited predisposition in absence of family history? So if she has presented with a synchronous or metachronous breast cancer bilateral. Okay. So bilateral breast cancer, especially if it is triple negative type. And what else? So there's another presentation where almost 80% of them will be found to have a, uh, no family history, but that presentation, almost 80% will be having a germline mutation. If a lady has, so you said bilateral breast cancer, synchronous or metachronous, any other yes, cancer, which is metachronous or synchronous will make it almost certainly a hereditary type. Any other con cancer, which is not so rare in females, which will make it almost certainly a hereditary. What is the name of the syndrome, by the way? So gastric uh, cancer. What is the name of the syndrome? So diffuse familial gastric cancer. CD. I'm not talking of that. That's a rare syndrome. The hereditary breast, which is the commonest syndrome in hereditary breast. Hereditary breast, what syndrome? Ovarian cancer, sir. Yeah. So, so, ovarian cancer. so if the lady says that I was treated for ovarian cancer two years ago when I was 37 and now at the age of 39, she comes with a triple negative breast cancer. Yes. Almost, okay. I will 80-90% of such cases will found to be uh, have a BRCA1 mutation or BRCA2. Okay? Yes, sir. Okay. So that is, see, you don't start with the rare things first. Start with the most common things first. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, so if we move on to this, that then this is the recent expansion to low priority group. If you have a strong family history, as Dr. Sarin rightly pointed out, mm -hmm. there is that's a high priority group. You have to mandatorily test, but the recent extension is, is to the low priority group. That is any patient age less than 40 or 45 years. It depends on the particular country's database and triple negative in young cancers are the ones where it's a mandatory testing. Now, uh, uh, before I go to uh, Karan, can you ex exactly explain what do you mean by a relative risk, an absolute risk, and a cumulative risk? Just a brief one, because that's a very important. So look at this. This is a particular family tree where you assess RR, AR, and CR. So can you tell me what is RR, what is AR, and what is CR? Sir, uh, relative risk is uh, um, is patient is having the particular risk, um, which any uh, factors which is uh, making that particular uh, condition to occur, sir, as compared to general population, sir. But not wrong. And, uh, sir, uh, Priyansh, can you be more specific on that? So I won't be able to give the exact yes. definition, sir. I would request Dr. Rajiv, if you could explain them very briefly. Anyway, what... before that, okay, relative risk, they could not explain right? what is AR and CR, at least that you explain. Okay, these are maybe you can say it's a statistical term, but absolute risk and cumulative risk. Let us uh, listen because as doctors, you know, we are not researchers always. So as doctors, you need to know what is the absolute risk and what is the cumulative risk. Uh, cumulative risk is over a particular period of time, the patient uh, having the particular risk to occur in this, uh, that duration, sir. That will be the cumulative risk. So, so say, give an example like? Sir, uh, for example, a particular uh, malignancy is occurring, uh, a particular factor, it is causing, uh, for example, uh, this BRCA mutation itself, sir. Uh, at, uh, uh, after 40 years of age or after 60, uh, 60 years of age, in that span, uh, how much is the risk? That is, how much is the lifetime risk, for example, a particular cancer can be as a cumulative risk. You can say cumulative risk up to a certain age, by the age 60 or by the age 75. So when you say lifetime risk is not till the age of 95, you know, people have various life expect uh, this thing. We will let us say let the, by the age of 75 or 80, the risk is say 80% or 75%. That is what you say, uh, the cumulative risk. Okay, so that cumulative risk we divide in females, in people who have mutation in this gene, and if they are females or males, their cumulative risk by the age of 75 is this much. 
and so how is this information before that let us talk about the absolute and relative risk so suppose we are relative risk we are talking about someone who was using hrt hormone replacement therapy okay uh, so what is when you say the re relative risk with the use of hormone replacement therapy is 1.3 so she is so, like 1.3 times more likely to get that event when we compare to the one who is compared to the one who was not taking the hrt so the exposure this is you trying to say that someone who had their exposure or not the exposure compared to that you you do that so why is the cumulative risk important to know that uh, what how does it help in what ways as a clinician why would you bother about you know all these things in research papers statisticians talk about that as a clinician why would you be interested to know what is the cumulative risk so, so can i explain by the, giving it an example yeah. so yeah. when we talk about the risk of uh, contralateral breast cancer being developing in the braca test yes. braca mutation we yeah. give the cumulative risk of 10 at 10 years at 20 years at 30 years yes. okay. so if we know what age the patient is currently is then we yeah. can give her the cumulative risk at the end of 20 years or 30 years. Okay. So higher the cumulative risk, maybe we can guide them better regarding the management. And sometimes people also just describe incident that I had 100 patients and in the 100 patients, uh, say five patients developed contralateral breast cancer. So I can just describe the incidence. Contralateral breast cancer incidence is 5%. Whereas someone else has calculated the cumulative risk over 10 years, the contralateral breast cancer risk is this much. So uh, what, what, what are these two things different and which is more reliable? So cumulative risk will be reliable, sir. Okay, so why not just describing incidence? What is the fallacy in that? Sir, because it looks at a particular time uh, spot, sir. Uh, and uh, whereas cumulative risk is over a period of time and that is uh, things uh, more relevant, sir. Okay. Okay, I think oh. we can move ahead. Yeah. So, so you are, I, you know, uh, Dr. Sarkar, I'll ask on the MRI. So in a patient with uh, whom you have done MRI, in what ways it can change the clinical management? Okay, okay. The MRI thing has come on. MRI plate of the patient. However, as I said, the team chose to do an MRI and this shows that there is a heterogeneous mass with enhancement and the type 3 curve, no lesion on the contralateral breast. So yes, the question that you rightly asked, uh, can MRI change your treatment plan? Karan, please. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, if, it, uh, so if at all there are multiple uh, lesions sir, in ipsilateral breast, definitely the particular uh, breast we have to address uh, as a part of a mastectomy, if at all the lesions are not being accompanied in a single incision. Uh, whether, and uh, second thing is uh, uh, bilateral breast malignancy, uh, we'll have to address both the breasts accordingly, sir, based on the location of the lesions. And if okay. it's CT is affordable, we can do it if possible. Sir. Uh, Priyansh, would you would you agree to what uh, Karan told? I mean, uh, yes, ultracentricity is will be better assessed, and your plan from conservation to mastectomy may be changed because of MRI. Yes, sir. and one more I'd link to have that we will have a baseline MRI so that we can follow up the patient uh, regularly. So we can have a baseline MRI before starting any therapy one. And second, it will aid in my breast conservation surgery. Okay. So I'll just ask one more yeah, question. Sorry. Yeah. So of course, this patient was 37 and had a family history. If suppose she didn't have a family history and she was a little older, what could be the fallacy of using MRI, the downside of it? We know all that about good things about MRI. What would be the downside of using MRI? Breast MRI. So, if it is biopsy proven, then uh, it is of useful, sir. If it is not biopsy proven, uh, there is a chance of false positivity, sir. Uh, okay. Multiple uh, benign biopsies will uh, lead the patient to unnecessary apprehension, sir. So, that is one of the issues with MRI. And what are the issues in uh, MR guided biopsies? Impalpable lesion. What are the issues with that? Sorry, sorry. Because you order an MRI, patient comes back that the doc report shows that something else is there which you can't feel. It's not seen on ultrasound. So could it create an issue for you? And patient has read the report and gets worked up. Yes, sir. Patient won't be uh, satisfied with the report. So what, what are the issues? At least you should be aware. Would you send it to any MRI center or 
specifically uh, there should be the particular uh, radiologist should be trained with the uh, uh, biopsies uh, as per mr because mr is a uh, very special modality and uh, only particular radiologist only trained have the uh, correct technique to do that uh, the mr guided biopsy, biopsy is not uh, you know you have to have the mr you cannot do with anything else it's a magnetic field strong magnetic field okay carry on i'm done so just to sum up to priyansh and to karan uh, generally MRI in, in 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 not in this case. Generally, MR should not be a determinant to understand whether you should do a breast conservation or not. But in this particular patient, because of dense base, because of familial predisposition, you might choose to do an MR uh, to see if there is any non-mass enhancement suggestive of multicentric DCIS or not. But fortunately for this lady, we didn't have anything like that. Now I go to uh, Priyansh now, I ended I possibly with Karan. Now let us take the treatment issue, four cross four, N0. Uh, obviously we are not going to generally go for a, a systemic screening, triple negative, BRCA1 positive. Now you have three choices in front of you Priyansh. You have a new adjuvant systemic therapy, all cycles followed by surgery. You have a new adjuvant systemic therapy, three to four cycles followed by surgery, followed by adjuvant therapy, or an upfront surgery followed by adjuvant therapy. Your take, Priyansh. Uh, sir, as a patient is a TNBC and BRCA mutated, I would like to have the new adjuvant chemotherapy first. Uh, all such, such, such cycles uh, followed by surgery, sir. Okay, I go to Karan. Would, yes, you, would you agree with your friend or you want to disagree? Yes, sir. Uh, I agree with him, sir. Uh, for triple negative breast cancer, uh, T2, it's a uh, this is T2 N0, sir. So we'll go for a new agent therapy, full cycles, followed by uh, surgery. Sir. Okay, I hope there is no controversy regarding that. So I'm not going to drag the question to the next level. Now, uh, this is where the patient came to me. She told me, uh, Doctor, I want to preserve the breast. And believe me, I am a very extremely conservative man. I was thinking in my mind whether I should do a breast conservation or not. And I was taught that breast conservation is contraindicated in, in this case. Now I go to Priyansh. Priyansh, would you agree with you, me or you want to debate it out with me? Your time so starts. So I would like to debate it out with you. So yeah, I, if the... If the patient wants breast conservation, I will offer her a breast conservation surgery, even if she is a BRCA mutated. Okay. So, Karan, uh, would you agree with me or you disagree with me? Sir, I will disagree with you, sir. Uh, we will go. We'll give the option of breast conservation surgery, but at the cost, patient should be also explained regarding the risk of ipsilateral new primary breast lesion along with contralateral uh, breast malignancy chances, sir. So it's, I think I, I'm losing out this debate. And so uh, the house would tend to believe that it is not generally a contraindication for breast conservation surgery. Now I go to the next situation. The patient comes back to me after two weeks. He ha she had an extensive discussion with her friends and had chatted in the Google and blogs, et cetera. And she comes back to me, it's the same patient. And on her second preoperative visit, now she wants a mastectomy, including contralateral risk reducing mastectomy. Again, I go to Priyansh. No, now, sorry. before yes. Go, yes. there must be a rationale why the patient has gone through a lot of literature and sites and blogs. And Priyansh, she wants, uh, what is the incidence of contralateral disease in such case? So she was diagnosed at the age of 37. So like the... Uh, 10 year in uh, five year incidence of the contralateral breast malignancy will be around 10 percent, sir, 8 to 10 percent. So it will cumulate, it will increase. So 10 year incidence will be around 20 percent. So that's exactly what we were asking. So here comes the importance of the cumulative risk. Now, how would, can you, Priyans, uh, elaborate a bit? Now, suppose there is one, what would be the uh, contralateral in incidence of contralateral disease? There are two or there are three strong familial predisposition. Would the risk increase? Yes, I did not get the equation, sir. Take if the there is a single family history, I agree with you, the incidence is close to 10 to 11 percent. But if suppose there are three breast cancer histories in the family, 
would the cumulative risk of contralateral disease increase? No, sir. The contralateral breast, the contralateral will be depending upon the BRCA mutation, not the amount of the number of the uh, history, sir. Okay. Uh, so, I, I go to current. Yeah, yeah. current. Uh, so definitely, sir. The pattern in which the families are affected, sir, it has a, uh, it will affect definitely affect the risk of ipsilateral and contralateral malignancy, sir. So that is also an important uh, criteria while choosing uh, surgeries for such patients. Exactly. So that is a point I want to make. Dr. Uh, Sarin, please, your take. What would the cumulative risk increase if there are more number of uh, uh, history in the family? In those who have a very early onset and with a strong family history, their incidence of ipsilateral as well as contralateral breast cancer is higher. Okay. But the data of this is not because there's always an ascertainment bias. Initially, most of the patients who were tested for BRCA testing or in these high-risk clinics were those who had a strong family history. So uh, in those who do not have a strong family history, you are not suspecting, but you just happen to find a BRCA1 mutation, a BRCA2 mutation, you will find that their contralateral breast cancer risk is lower, somewhat lower. But it's not dramatically lower. So you take everything into account, you will still counsel them for everything. And, and this is BRCA1. So if it was BRCA2, uh, would it be in any case different when you will be counseling these patients and families for BRCA2? Karan, your, the question goes to you. No, sir. Uh, it will be the uh, same only, sir. For all the high risk parental genes, sir, I will counsel the same things. And if it is ATM or check two. So for check two, uh, it is uh, the um, guidelines is apart from the particular deletion that is uh, 110 1100 deletion, sir. Mm -hmm. Only that particular uh, mutation is carrying high risk. Apart from other mutations of check two, also uh, we uh, they have to go with the as per how is the family affected of that individual. We will go according to that. Sir. Otherwise, uh, there is we can't uh, we we should not offer uh, this upfront mastectomy and uh, risk reducing sir, for such cases. So for 1100 Del C, for that you would offer? Yes, yes, for that, definitely, sir, because it has a higher relative risk of uh, malignancies. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> now, consider the patient wants this. Now, Karan, uh, is it justified to undertake a contralateral risk reducing mastectomy? I mean, would you agree to this statement by the patient? Yes, sir, sure. Sir. I will uh, because patient is willing uh, and also she knows the uh, definitely we must have counseled uh, regarding the risk of the contralateral breast. So definitely we can go ahead with the contralateral risk reducing mastectomies. Okay, I go to Priyansh before we go to the next slide. Uh, I mean, would you recommend doing a primary reconstruction in the same sitting? Priyansh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can offer the uh, primary reconstruction if she is undergoing bilateral mastectomy. Uh, she does have the option of the autologous or the implant-based primary reconstruction. Okay. Now I go to Karan. Karan, you have four choices for this patient. Okay. Now, number one is, uh, you have to pick one of them. Number one is bilateral modified radical mastectomy. Number two is right, which is the affected side. You undertake a modified radical mastectomy plus left simple mastectomy. Number three is right mastectomy plus sentinel lymph node biopsy plus left mastectomy plus sentinel lymph node biopsy. And number four is right mastectomy plus sentinel lymph node biopsy on the right side plus left mastectomy only. What's your take? Sir, uh, uh, option fourth, I will go, sir. Okay, so Priyansh, you yes, sir. are going to debate it out with... No, sir, uh, no, sir. I agree with the option four, sir. Okay, so uh, uh, Dr. Sarin, I, I, I'm sure it's not your uh, cup of tea, surgery no. specifically. So, but... no, I mean, I deal with this very often in the hereditary cancer clinic because after the mutation, before surgery... So nothing is mentioned about reconstruction. So I, 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 reconstruction is routine. I mean, I, I, yeah. we have agreed on reconstruction. The okay. primary surgery uh, that has to be offered to the patient, okay. mastectomy plus SLNB on the affected side and left-sided mastectomy only. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. So would it be given as an option to patients? What are the options you will give? You know, when you have these cases, you give them, it is not you just, okay, you just write, okay, bilateral or right mastectomy and plus SLN me and left mastectomy. So what are the options and what would you explain to them? So the really the option will be between two and four. Yeah. I, I'm not going to take up the debate on SLNB in yes. NST. Yeah, that we are not really talking about. So the appropriate yeah. auxiliary, you know, surgery. So mastectomy with appropriate axillary surgery, that is obviously, so whichever is appropriate. Okay. And the left side, obviously, will not require any axillary surgery. Yes. Okay. So what we write is there, one is the therapeutic in such situation. So instead of just writing one is the therapeutic, other is prophylactic. Yeah. Just, to, be, just to yeah. distinguish between the two. So like many times, so they would, so most of the times patients comes to you after the surgery with the genetic testing. Normally it doesn't happen that it has happened in the, in the beginning itself before your surgery. So then we, we, uh, you know, we specify. So which side is, Therapeutic surgery, which side is prophylactic surgery? Done. Take it. Okay. Now, again, I possibly left at current. So I go to Priyansh. Now, Priyansh, uh, you have these options. Okay. What would you choose? And uh, so, option one as a reconstruction can be bilateral, microvascular, ALT. Option two can be bilateral, autologous, LD. Option three can be bilateral implant plus LD, and option four is bilateral implant with ADM pocket. Your Priyansh, your choice. I'd like to pass these questions. Okay, that's great. Now, if I can go to Karan, uh, no, sir, there is no negative marking in this. Sir, uh, uh, what is the previous breast uh, uh, composition, sir? That I will see, sir. Accordingly, I have to plan whether a bilateral uh, uh, bilateral implant plus LDA or uh, option two or three. I will uh, decide based on this. Option two or three, two or three based on the patient's uh, initial breast composition. Okay, so suppose it's a cup C breast, then what will you choose? And if it's a cup double D breast, what will you choose? So cup C, uh, cup C, we can go for uh, bilateral autologous LD uh, lattice losses and uh, various options. Uh, for double D, we can go ahead with uh, bilateral uh, yeah, option 3 or option 1 also will be feasible. Sir. Okay. So I understand yeah. both of you are trying to avoid option 4. So my next question, so this is the patient I am talking about. Uh, that's bilateral reconstruction that we have done. So uh, as you are trying to avoid the fourth one, can any of you say, let's take Karan first. Can any of us tell me what exactly is ADM? Uh, sir, I will. Sorry, sir, I will. Okay. Table yeah. full form, sir. It is a acellular dermal matrix, sir. And what is that? Now you see the picture. This is my picture, and that's the acellular dermal matrix that we are using. Can you tell me what is acellular dermal matrix? I'd like to pass this. Okay, so uh, I am sure this is not a question for Dr. Sarin. So I have to bail both of you out, uh, not being an examiner. It's an acellular dermal matrix is you either take a bovine or a porcine. Now you have human skin as well and move everything out except the collagen that is laid down. It's a sort of a mesh uh, and you can actually create a pocket and just take an implant of the desired site and wrap it like just like a samosa, just like look like a samosa. You can wrap it and, and then hinge it. And that actually creates the pocket. But initially, we used to have hold that implant with a latissimus dorsi mycutaneous flap. Now, once we have ADM, it becomes so very easy that you can complete the reconstruction 30 minutes on one side and 30 minutes on the other side. So is it clear to you what is an acellular dermal matrix? Yes, sir. Okay. So I go to the just, next. I would just yeah. add one thing. Many surgeons that, you know, who deal with this, they prefer a DIEP flap for bilateral breast reconstruction. So I just tell you what we, I see the practice. Many yeah, DIEP is, is another very good option, but yeah. I see many of the surgeons 
plastic surgeons now shifting to ALT because of lesser morbidity. But of okay. course, DIAP is a very good choice. Okay. Now I go to the post-operative histopathology. That's a six millimeter perimarker residue with an infiltrating ductal cancer, grade three, no LVI, PNI, concentric response, margin negative, no lesion on the contralateral side, node was negative, and it's again triple negative, KI67 is 36%. Okay, now I go, what? of course, the first question, now that you, are you going to put in radiation in this patient? I, I'm going to ask this to Karan. Karan? Sir, one request, sir. Can I get the previous slides? Oh, sure. So it's a YPT1B, YPN0, PNBC. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, sir. Is it okay, Karan? Yes, sir. Sure. Karan? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, is it okay, sir? We can go for next slide. Priyansh? Yes, sir. Sir, we can move on to the next slide, sir. We go to the next to... slide. We have 10 minutes more for discussion. So, Dr. Sarkar, you can move the next to the next slide. Can you hear me? He has come out. Oh, I, I don't know. I am sharing it once again, I'm sure. Am I visible? Yeah, your slides are visible. Yeah, move ah. to the next slide, please. Just a minute. Okay, am I visible and audible? Yes, sir. Okay, I don't know. Certain, certain. It must be an internet hitch suddenly. Now, uh, I, I, I totally lost your answer, Karan. What would be the role of radiation? Are you going to radiate this lady? No, sir. I won't uh, radiate this lady, sir. Okay, and no. Priyansh? No, sir. No, sir. Because T two N zero initial stage, and so finally also remain T one N zero. So. No role of radiation. So at this point of time, would your pre-NST status dictate your reconstruction plan for this patient? And sorry, before we go to that, so is the radiation decided on the basis of the pathology of post-NSCT or yeah. the initial presentation? Suppose it was a locally advanced breast cancer, node positive. Uh, and if suppose it was a path response, path CR, your answer would have still been the same? No, sir. No, sir. The radiation will depend on yes, the, and... so the initial stage. Okay. Okay. Carry so on. that's exactly what I'm asking that would your pre NST, the original status, dictate your uh, re reconstruction plan? Yes, sir. Karan? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, so what would you choose if it was a 5.6 centimeter uh, or, or just a skin tether lesion? Would you still like to go for an implant or you uh, select something else? So autologous uh, graft would have been better, sir. Uh, yeah, your point is well taken. Now I go to the next one. Now, at this point, what would be the role of PAR inhibitor in adjuvant setting and what are the current evidences in favor or against it? Sir, yes, sir. Recently, we have the uh, trial which showed the uh, PFS benefit of giving adjuvant uh, olaparib. Just, uh, they have given a three-year, I guess, three-year short-term data presented in 2021. So based on that, the SQS also updated that in guideline that adjuvant olaparib can be considered uh, in non-metastatic setting in BRCA mutated patients. Okay, I go to Dr. Sarin. Dr. Sarin, would you uh, agree to the interim reports that have come out in favor of adjuvant olaparib as of now? Yes, sir. 
Yeah. So the Olympia trial reported last year in NEGM by Andrew Tat and all, which showed that adjuvant olaparib uh, reduced uh, the risk of recurrence as well as death. So of course, uh, so it is useful. But the question is, in which set of patient you need to give it? Those who haven't had a response, uh, you know, complete response, a pathological response, they will derive more benefit. And in India, we know there's financial toxicity, not just in India, everywhere else in the world. This drug is associated with financial toxicity. Plus, just because it is oral doesn't mean it does not have side effects. So it has also side effects. You could have severe anemia and other side effects. So you have to balance everything and before you recommend this. Now, I go to the second capsule. Uh, now, this is a far more, uh, I mean, a complex situation. This is about a 36 years female. She was 37, she's 36, who visited our preventive oncology clinic at IPGM RSS Chem Hospitals, Kolkata. Her mother uh, at 60 years of age had recently been diagnosed with breast cancer and is presently under treatment in our institute. Her maternal aunt also had breast cancer at the age of 40 years. Her grandmother died of some abdominal malignancy. Of course, she is unable to state what exactly all the papers were lost. And she wants to know her possibility of developing breast cancer or any cancer for that matter. Now, I am going to go to Priyansh first. Yes, sir. Now, what are your options? You have two options in front of you. Are you going to reassure the patient and tell that, well, it's fine, but I'm sure you have to be very careful and do perform your breast self-examination and come back to us if you find something, or are you going to refer the patient to a family history clinic? Sir, I will refer the patient to a, a family history clinic. Now, what uh, would be your criteria for referring a patient to a family history clinic? She has a significant family history, like one uh, first degree relative with a breast cancer and two second degree relatives with a history of some malignancy and one being a breast malignancy at the age of 40 years. So looking at the significant family history, I would like to refer the patient. Sir. Okay. Now, before referring a patient, I go to Karan. Can you enumerate few risk assessment model name? You were touching something, but would you like to once again tell us few common risk assessment models that are being used? Whether they can be used in India or not is debatable, but can you enumerate some of them? Yes, sir. Uh, so uh, first is a Gale model, sir. Other models are uh, uh, Dyer Cruising models, sir. Then we have Braca Pro models. Sir. Then uh, we have Boyde Shea models. Okay, so what is the role of risk assessment with softwares? Why do people would uh, use a software? They can go straight to a BRCA testing. And as you said, these are the things that are off available in front of you. Of course, they are not validated. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Sarin would be able to sell the same words. Dr. Sarin, before we move on, I mean, uh, do you think these models are valid in Indian practice? Okay, so they have not been they have not been validated for our Indian patients. Uh, but I think based on the family history itself, this is important that this patient needs genetic risk assessment. My question is: most hospitals do not have a genetics clinic or a family risk clinic. What would you do then? So everyone would expect that the surgeon who's done MCH surgical oncologist would know what to be done. So what would you do? Karan, yes, the sir. question is to you. Sir, uh, we know the protocols to uh, manage this patient, sir. Uh, these are hereditary breast cancer. Uh, whether patient is index uh, mal uh, presenting with index malignancy or uh, as a as part of preventive, sir, uh, we'll have to follow the basic protocols as enumerated in the particular guidelines like NCCN, sir. We'll follow the same, sir. And uh, definitely after the um, uh, treatment of uh, um, we'll, uh, in concurrently with the treatment, we'll send the patient to get the testing also done for this gene. Sir. Okay. Okay. Done. I think you can carry on. I think we have just a few minutes left. So we'll brush very fast. What? So these are the basically, they, they take into consideration both family and the lifestyle factors. 
and this is an example of the gale model where you can put in the data and this is the guidelines widget now this is what i'm going to emphasize on you that uh, you can actually risk asset if the if it's a low risk that means the risk is less than three percent and the lifetime risk is uh, less than 17 percent then you can push the patient to the primary care of that particular country if it's some moderate risk then refer the patient to a breast clinic to decide uh, i mean a family history clinic but if it's a high risk then the patient can directly go for a genetic testing without using a, a softwares. I mean, softwares do have a role in countries where it is validated, but it is basically a tria triaging tool, not exactly to diagnose anything. Now, I'm not going to go into, I'm sure we are running behind the schedule. I will go to the highlights. Now, our, this is a rapid round for Karan and Priyansh, okay? Yes, Karan, sir. are you ready? Yes, sir. Okay, your, your question starts. What methodology is used for gene testing? So next generation sequencing. Next. Okay, so I go to Priyansh. What material is used for genetic testing? We take the blood sample and fragmented DNAs from that. Okay, can you use the tissue as well? Yes, sir. When will you use the blood and when will you use the tissue? If the patient has undergone any hemopoietic stem cell transplantation, then I would like to use the tissue as the blood. In general, the answer to the question is, if it's a familial or a hereditary disease, then you can use blood. But if it's a sporadic one, which fits into a low priority testing, then no, it has to be. No, I think you need to know whether you're doing germline testing or somatic yeah, testing. Yeah, germline exactly. testing is for family risk. Somatic testing is for only treatment point of view, like you're doing ovarian cancer, tumor tissue. So you should know you're ordering for a germline genetic testing or somatic testing. Yeah. What, again, uh, Karan, what yes. do you understand by comprehensive genetic analysis? Sir, comprehensive genetic analysis means uh, uh, most of the high penetrance genes and uh, high and moderate pen penetrance genes we are uh, using to uh, identify the mutations. Okay. And then when will you do a targeted, in which particular area you are going to do a targeted mutational analysis? Sir, when yes. The patient, uh, uh, her family member is uh, post tested positive for a particular gene mutation, sir. I will uh, carry on the same mutation. I will test for this uh, uh, now the presenting case, sir. No, exactly. In sir, in which community you you use targeted mutational analysis? Sir, Ashkenazi Jewish is the uh, uh, we are using sir this targeted mutational analysis. Yeah, I go to Priyansh. Uh, can you elaborate the role of tissue banking and bioinformatics in such uh, which Dr. Sarin is doing at present? What would be the role of tissue banking and bioinformatics? So, tissue banking will help, help us to look for mutation uh, in the future time. So if we have the tissue with us, we can again go back to the tissue and carry on more studies and more tests. And that will add on to uh, our information regarding the same. And what do you understand by bioinformatics? Can you enumerate some sites where you get the bioinformatics in India? Some? Sorry, where yeah. you get the bioinformatics? Do you know what is a bioinformatics? Yeah, I got it, sir, but I don't know any place that can definitely get the bioinformatics. Okay, so you can go into the NABL and actually in the NML, you can actually put in and get all the nucleic acid sequences so that it's important that to feed in the data because it's the if you look at the amino acid sequence it's from the protein that is generated from BRCA it is 1880 or it is 3000 plus so unless you actually upload the data in the long run you won't be able to understand which is the common sequence where the changes occur so you have to upload it now I go to current. What is uh, a mutation of unknown significance? So uh, these are the mutations which are identified, but uh, we don't know whether this uh, uh, is the causative for that particular malignancy, sir. So this is a uh, uh, broad area, sir. So uh, and we don't uh, 
use this for intervention of the patient also, sir. Of okay. all these notices the cost. So I'm not going, we have already discussed on this and I'm not going to take you through this, but this is a very basic chart which everybody must remember because these are the common ones to be used. Now, you have three options in this patient. Option one, I go to Priyansh. Yes. Uh, option one is an intensified screening. Option two is a tamoxifen. And option three is reducing mastectomy. Which one will you choose for this patient? You can yeah, discuss. Patient, yes, sir. Yeah. This patient, like, do we have a genetic mutation till... Have you tested yeah. the patient yet? Yeah, we have tested the patient and she is positive. There is a mutation in, in exon 37 or 23, something like that. We can give the option of intensified screening and uh, both the reducing mastectomy and the intensified screening both. Sir. What do you understand it by intensified screening? Intensified screening is the... like. It is a different from the screening of the normal population. In the high risk population, the screening will include the annual MRI along with the mammogram. And she is 36 years of age. So that will continue on to the 70 years. When will you start it? Sir, 25 years, sir. Why 25 years? Karan, uh, would you agree to 25 years? Yes, sir. From 25 years onwards only, we'll start the screening. The, the, the guideline states it should be five years younger than the youngest detected cancer in the family. Okay. Actually, so earlier, we'll, test, we'll take that criteria. Okay. So, five years younger than the youngest detected cancer. Now, Karan, I go to you. What is your take on tamoxifen? Pros and cons? Uh, tamoxifen can be uh, based on this family history, sir. Uh, uh, I will possibly go for risk reduction mastectomy. I will guide the patient through this. Uh, I, I just asked you what are the uh, pros and what are the cons of using tamoxifen? The tamoxifen uh, has been uh, found to delay the uh, uh, to uh, prevent the risk of uh, malignancy, sir, in this patient, sir, up to 40 to 50 percent uh, is uh, chance, sir. But uh, uh, it's not a hundred percent foolproof for it, especially for this BRCA mutation uh, patients. So. What are the I will avoid uh, this, uh, I preferentially risk reducing mastectomy will be the better, better choice. And what are the cons? Sir, uh, there is a still, uh, even after tamoxifen also patient has the uh, chance of malignancy. Uh, 50% uh, there is chance. And what other possibilities long-term tamoxifen use can give rise to? The other malignancies uh, uh, risk uh, also like uh, uh, carcinoma endometrium patient will be suffering. And also along with other vascular complications also patient is prone for this with the use of okay. tamoxifen for long durations. Okay, I go to Priyansh. Yes, sir. Risk reducing mastectomy. What would be the amount of risk reduction when you do a risk reducing mastectomy? It will be around... Uh, 90 to 95 percent and if we include this albingo it will be close to 99 98 so we are we are concentrating on the breast let us not 95 percent sir 95 nah, okay so i will go once again to karan now this is the breast and you are going to do a mastectomy uh, can you suggest why you cannot get a hundred percent reduction sir uh, uh... Uh, doing a mastectomy uh, does not uh, remove entire breast tissue. So there is still some microscopic uh, breast tissue will be uh, available, especially in the undersurface of uh, uh, skin flaps. Sir. Why? So, so as a part of surgical, uh, there is still possibility that we are leaving very minimal breast tissue. We are still leaving. Sir. So that is a uh, source of uh, giving this uh, a recurrence. Sir. Okay. Let me explain you. Now, suppose you, you go through this plane. Now you see, uh, what you are going to find is that in spite of your best efforts, the breast tissue can actually creep in through around the Cooper's ligament. So once you do a mastectomy, even if you do the best mastectomies, uh, the peri Cooper's ligament tissue is going to be left back. And this is the reason that you can at best attain somewhere around 95%, but on average, it's a 91% reduction in the risk. Okay. So I uh, come to the take home. The take home would be that, okay, number one, 
Okay, so the take home from this discussion is uh, breast cancer is caused due to germline or sporadic mutation. We can have a discussion hugely because sporadic mutation is far more interesting than the germline mutation. The standard of care had been high priority testing. I mean, we were the capsule two, which was the area where for the last two, two decades we were banging on. But the focus has shifted to low priority testing. I mean, young age, triple negative less than 60 years or less than for between 45 to 50 years, large number of familial background or male breast cancer are where the focus has shifted for low priority testing. Softwares, though not validated, but are good tools for triaging in the mid-risk group. Genetic counseling, we did not take the discussion, has a significant role to play before you do the test. There is a strong evidence in favor of preventive intervention in gene mutation positive individuals, but far more interesting, we did a bit discussion on that, that there is evolving evidence in favor of therapeutic strategies in symptomatic mutation positive individuals. So thank you very much. Uh, the stage is off to Dr. Sarin and I will stop sharing it. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ritin Sarkar, for uh, that amazing effort in conducting this session. Uh, we'll quickly move on to our uh, next segment, which would be the expert talk uh, by Dr. Rajiv Sarin. Uh, whilst he uh, loads his screen, uh, I'll request uh, Dr. Ritin Sarkar to kindly go through the Q&A and chat uh, sections of the software and try to answer uh, some of the queries that uh, uh, people have left. And uh, whatever uh, remains, we'll just carry forward that to the last five minutes of the Q&A. Uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Sari. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll, uh, I think many of the things that were already discussed, but uh, being a clinician myself, I know some of the things that are very not, not very clear to us clinicians. I think the present generation of clinicians who are getting trained, probably they are better than our generation, but still I will share some of the things which I think there are myths and not clear and which have a bearing on our practice. And I will talk more of practice oriented. So as you see here, this is uh, what I've shown you. There is a chromosome. And uh, so the, the chromosomes are there, which are made up of chromatid. This is a chromatin loop. Each chromatin loop has more than about 100,000 base pair of DNA. Then the DNA is wound around the histone proteins. And then this is what we know DNA as a double helix, but it is actually, it is a structure on the chromatin. And then the DNA this is a central dogma of molecular biology. So there is, the gene has a specific sequence. So you have the up regulatory sequence upstream, then the, uh, this is ribosomal binding sequence and the start codon, then there are multiple exons in a gene. In between the exons, there are introns. And then there's a termination region and down. So this, we start from the five prime untranslated region and then three prime untranslated region. So in the transcription process, the pre-mRNA is made in pre-mRNA, the introns are there. And then in the mature uh, uh, mRNA is made after splicing out of the uh, uh, intronic uh, DNA. And then finally you have mature RNA, then translation, post-translational modification. Then you have a three-dimensional structure called protein, which have folds, ribbons, etc. And proteins do the job. So what happens, the type of mutation, you could have a chromosomal alteration, like we know in Down syndrome, so uh, like trisomy. So when, there's a, when the whole chromosome is deleted or duplicated or translocated, there will almost always be some phenotypic effect. It may or may not be a disease, but definitely a distinct phenotypic effect. Now, if we talk about the single gene, so in a single gene, you could have a large deletion or duplication of parts of a gene, like say one exon is deleted or uh, one intron is, uh, uh, you know, in, in exon and intron is deleted or duplicated. Whenever this happens, the protein that is made out of such gene which will never be the normal protein and it will be so uh, of abnormal shape. The function of protein depends upon its shape that it will almost always be pathogenic. So that depends whatever is the function of that gene. Uh, uh, disease or a trait relevant to the function of that gene would appear if that gene is important. Then you could have a small insertion or deletion. That means few bases like one AA is added or one AG is deleted. 
okay so small insertion or deletion so they could be in frame that means a uh, full three bases of a codon are inserted or missed then you could have just one amino acid is added or like in uh, braca1 protein there are 1860 odd amino acid you may have just one amino acid less or one amino acid more these may or may not be having a pathogenic effect so wherever it is written in green that means it may have no effect red that means it will have a pathogenic effect then you could have a frame shift frame shift that means in this is a open reading frame you have one uh, base is deleted or inserted then the reading frame is shifted all the codons change and then it introduces a stop codon so you will have a truncated pro uh, protein imagine this half of the protein was missing it will not be able to function and it will be pathogenic then you could have a single nucleotide variation these are the most common variations we find in genes in single nucleotide variants what happens is that the different kinds of single nucleotide variants one is a silent that means a nucleotide has changed but the amino acid is still the same so almost all are benign uh, these are what we call a single nucleotide polymorphism snps because the amino acid has not changed sometimes they are in a particular location in the dna binding region or the gene regulatory uh, uh, you know sequence or a splicing sequence and they could have an effect then miss sense that means they sense for a different amino acid so most of these are snps a few of them are pathogenic and the remaining are vus variant of uncertain significance we will talk about then splice site splice site that means variant which are in the splicing region which is in the intron exon boundary plus minus 3 these are the conserved splice site and a little further away also so they will cause aberrant splicing so when you have a mature rna it might retain an intron or a or a exon may be deleted so again that will be pathogenic then non sense that means it does not sense for an amino acid but senses for a stop codon again truncated protein and they will be all pathogenic so i mean clinicians who learn so many complex thing learning this is not so difficult but we haven't paid attention to this so if you understand this when we read a report so normally we just read the interpretation but i think more and more you will have to make an effort to go through this disc see how the variant is described and what is the meaning of that so if you see a nonsense or a splice site or a frame shift variant in braca1 or any other high penetrance genes you know that this is a, a pathogenic but if it is a miss sense then you very carefully read whether it is truly pathogenic or not so uh, sometimes you know these are the different ways uh, germline variants are called so sometimes it is a challenge to call it pathogenic or a vus or a benign pathogenic is the type of mutation as i mentioned truncating splice site large genomic rearrangement or a known pathogenic or likely pathogenic miss sense variant these are very rare in healthy population genomic databases there are several of them and as compared to this the benign or likely benign variants so these are either deep intron that means in the introns which is not expected to cause any problem or they are synonymous or silent or they are known miss sense single nucleotide polymorphism so generally they will not be very rare in healthy population genomic databases or if they are rare then functional or family studies have been done and shown that they are not pathogenic and any variant that you find which is a rare or a novel variant and it is not fitting into the criteria of either pathogenic or a benign that is what we call a variant of uncertain significance like you know when we started doing mri initially or a pet ct a lot of things we used to say we used to find something we were not sure what it means so same is true for genomics because the genomic database especially for non caucasian population are not as large so that's why we find many variants which are rare and we are not sure whether they are disease associated or benign so you know what is cancer uh, you know i won't go into the details what i want to distinguish is all cancers are a genetic disease since gene genetic alterations in the genes or chromosomes are a hallmark of all cancer cell okay no one has ever seen a cancer cell where all the genes and chromosomes are normal and the defect is only in the cell membrane or mitochondria but the term genetic refers to somatic genetic disorder and not the hereditary germline genetic disorder as seen in 5% of cancer so every cancer cell would have lot of genetic alterations and sometimes these are the germline that means which they inherit so that that's why the type of testing it could be either somatic testing somatic testing you are looking at the tumors so like an ovarian cancer or prostate cancer you might ask for ngs you are looking at what are the mutations that this tumor uh, cell has 
Based on that, you can use treatment. Whereas if you look on the blood sample or any normal tissue, you know what the person has inherited. The person is born with what gene variants or mutation, based on which not only the treatment could be offered, uh, but also the family testing. Why I'm showing this? Because a lot of people get confused. So all, all hereditary cancers are Mendelian and autosomal. They are not sex linked. So sometimes people ask this question whether you can get breast cancer from the father's side. Yes, because it is on chromosome 17 BRCA1 and chromosome 13 has BRCA2 and uh, P53 is also on BRCA1 on chromosome 17. So these are autosomes. Both men and uh, women have that. So half the time it is coming from the father's side. Just because fathers being males do not have that high cumulative risk as we discussed earlier. That's why you may get a negative family history on father's side because father is more likely to be unaffected carrier. Whatever we have learned about Mendelian disorders, that is through high penetrance genes. So when you say penetrance is 100 person, that means if 100 people are carrying that variant, pathogenic variant or mutation, all 100 develops the phenotype. If penetrance is 50 person, that means half the people with that will develop that uh, phenotype. Then there are intermediate penetrance genes like CHECK2, RAD50, ATM, heterozygous. So here the lifetime risk is increased several fold, but not very high, not like 80, 90 or 70 percent. Then increasingly, when you do more and more genes in the panel, you we find reports of genes, variants in genes whose penetrance is either very low or uncertain. So when you get a report like this, take it with a pinch of salt, do not act upon it. And in terms of counseling the patient and the family also, you have to be guarded. And this should be preferably done by someone who has experience with looking at genes which have uncertain or low penetrance. So this is uh, something I've drawn on my blackboard, which I use for counseling patients. So we know this is in the nutshell. Uh, what it is all about. We know that you know uh, when genes are mutated, uh, why we suspect someone's cancer to be hereditary either in family history or early onset bilateral or multiple or rare cancers or some features, syndromic features, we counseling, then genetic testing. And in genetic testing, you may find a mutation, you may no, not find a mutation or you may find a variant of uncertain significance. And more, uh, if you find a mutation based on that, there are therapy implications, like in BRCA1, you could give olaparib uh, or uh, platinum-based uh, drugs, or if it is like in the mismatch repair, the immunotherapy. Uh, and then if the patient has early cancer, then, you know, stage cancer, then the future cancer, early detection by screening all healthy members and prevention that we will talk about later. So both preventive surgery for the breast and ovaries, we will talk about it later. So this is one of the chapter that is Tata Hospital book is coming. We have written a chapter of a long complex chapter. Gene, NIFT of gene, then the syndrome, then the syndromic features, which cancer, what risk is there, then the another page of this. So, I mean, it's a student's nightmare. If you have to say that before the exam, you have to learn this table, it is impossible. I mean, even I, after I have written this, uh, made this table, I also cannot remember then what do we do? I mean, uh, and things are, of course, in an exam, you can still, you have to mug it up and you can clear an exam. You want to know, okay, what is a paraganglioma and SDH, B, C, and D. And then you look at the common syndrome, leave from any syndrome. But when you go and look in the books, you find there's so many different classical leave from any, by the time you understood and remember what is classical leave from any syndrome, then you saw there's a modification of leave from any like syndrome, Birch criteria, Chompret criteria, revised further, yields criteria. It is impossible for anyone to remember. Even I, although I see almost eight, 10 hereditary cancer families every day, I cannot remember all the versions and modifications of these. So what do you do? What do you remember? Because after all, we are practicing clinician. So, and you know, when you remember that, just look at this, it is such a sad thing. This lady, what she writes in Washington Post, damage for the rest of my life. Surgeon mistakenly removed her breast and uterus. Can you imagine this has happened in US? So the nurse misread her genetic BRCA genetic test result as positive and the gynec and breast surgeon happily performed the prophylactic surgeries. And that is why, you know, uh, I mean, it might appear bizarre, but this has happened and that's why it is in Washington Post and it could happen anywhere if it has happened in US. So that's why it took time to explain to you what are different kinds of variants and what are mutations. So that's why the, we prefer not to use the term mutation, but describe them as variants. And after, before the variants, we write the prefix as benign variant, likely benign variant, or 
you know pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant so this is uh, what we uh, I, I describe is the different kinds of uh, you know cancer so if you can't remember those tables and all so there are two types of cancer either hereditary cancers or sporadic sporadic means they are not because of any inherited risk so nutson he looked at the retinoblastoma there are two types of retinoblastoma unilateral bilateral bilateral are generally hereditary so he plotted the ages at which they get can cancer and he proposed that in the hereditary form obviously it is known that they are born with the first hit the tumor suppressor gene where in the sporadic forms when they are born there is no mutation and then the in the hereditary form during the lifetime like let us imagine the retina which has trillions of retinal cells just every retinal cell had one uh, mutation first hit each gene has a pair we know chromosome and in some uh, of the retinal cells second hit also happens as a result in in a matter of short period of time a person that child would have either multicentric retinoblastoma or bilateral retinoblastoma as compared to the sporadic form because at the time of birth there were no hits in any re retinal cells in the rb gene then the same cell has the first hit and second hit and then you have a unilateral cancer and later in life so because these hereditary forms they are driven by a particular genetic pathway they have organ specificity like if you say as uh, in breast cancer BRCA1 they would have breast and ovary cancer specific IC again if we talk of BRCA1 they will be generally triple negative or ovarian cancer it will be high grade serous ovarian cancer and molecular markers like they will have a TNBC and uh, they would be like basal cell and in some syndromes there will be syndromic feature I will talk about it and because they start there's a clonal proliferation of several transformed cells typically you would have more often multicentric or bilateral or multiple primary cancers and at an earlier age they will be diagnosed because of lead time in origin so that these are the uh, the hallmarks of all hereditary cancers so they would uh, tend to occur at a younger age compared to the sporadic counterparts often they would give a family history more likely to have bilateral or multiple primary cancers and because of what, depending on which genetic pathways involved you may have other hallmark features of that and some of them would have other benign manifestation of the syndrome so now talking about ordering and interpreting genetic test all of you would not be you know fortunate that you just refer a patient and that clinic would decide and what so you will have to order and also interpret genetic tests so first of all whether genetic test is indicated in that person and because no one can remember all the guidelines and all these models just follow the Nutsons to it hypothesis. Early onset, first of all, family history, early onset, multiple primary or bilateral and any other feature. Then who in the family should be tested? Ideally, the person affected at the youngest age should be tested or the typical cancer. Then what is the best sample for genetic testing? Ideally, blood. If not blood, then other uh, oral or uh, normal tissue. Uh, then testing whether you know for ovarian cancer this is an issue whether to germline or somatic or both so that depends what is the clinical context so you could test only the family mutation if it is already known if someone cannot afford then the hotspot or a specific mutation then one to two gene like suppose someone has medullary thyroid cancer i will only test for the red gene or you do a larger panel then interpret the results as i've mentioned how you have uh, what you describe and finally the best the true negative result is that if you have already found a mutation in the family and that has not been inherited by the sister or the daughter, then you say this lady has not inherited the BRCA1 mutation we had found in the family. Then it is your duty as a clinician to suspect that the testing was inadequate or the reporting was inadequate. Like I gave an example. So you had patient had done only BRCA1 and BRCA2, but then you saw that the patient has a very classical hereditary breast ovarian cancer. You suspect maybe there's a large genomic rearrangement which has been missed by that testing. So you might ask for MLP or some special test. Or then you suddenly suspect the patient tells that on a mother's side, there are many gastrointestinal cancer and someone had a polyp also. So then you suspect some other syndrome and then you see that whether that gene has been tested or not. So additional testing of genes. So genetically predisposed individuals, they are eminently suited for early detection and prevention because they are very high risk. And this risk can be identified by comprehensive genetic risk assessment and you can prevent deaths. That's what we want to do as doctors, that prevent suffering and death in people. But what happens in most of the low and middle income countries, including India, that despite these people knowing, having seen cancers in their family, they're present in late stages, 
Very few receive genetic counseling. Clinical molecular syndromic diagnosis is seldom made in pre-symptomatic stage and even after cancer diagnosis. The penetrance estimates were not available. We have now produced some of these and the issue of uh, cost, access and compliance to genetic testing and high-risk screening and preventive surgery. Okay, so there are three components of uh, testing, pre-test counseling, genetic testing and post-test counseling and I will show some of those uh, examples. But all this will happen only if someone has suspected that it will be the doctor that this patient has inherited predisposition and then refer them for counseling and or testing. So just remember nuts in and you will get it right. So few things I will talk about the principles of genetic counseling because more often than not these are there are consequences of non-adherence to these principles for the patient, for the family and also physician. And I have seen that these principles, the way we practice medicine in India, many of these principles are routinely flouted and I don't have to you know explain this uh, uh, to you all. So autonomy, empathy, beneficence, non-maleficence, non-directiveness, informed decision, confidentiality. So I will, you know, in another, for the longer class, I will take another full lecture on this. So as doctors for everything, we make syndromic diagnosis and differential diagnosis. Same is true in the cancer genetics clinic. So you based on the type of cancer, the age at cancer diagnosis, whether it's unilateral, bilateral, histological feature, then who all are affected, then other phenotypic features uh, that you see. And then, and then other features. You make a good clinical pathological based syndromic diagnosis. And this is very useful if the family is unable to do a large panel or in interpreting viewers in a particular gene, whether there are some features of the syndrome. So this slide, I show that some people think that every case, what you read in textbook, textbook presentation is the most uncommon presentation of most you know, things. And so like classical HBOC is the, which is even in confirmed mutation carriers, classical features like early onset TNBC, bilateral, strong family history may not be apparent or missing due to incomplete or unreliable family history or a small family. Incomplete penetrance, 20-30% carriers do not develop cancer, even female BRCA carriers. Then in BRCA2, the cancers generally occur after 40 years and these are generally not triple negative. Half the time it is coming from father's side who remains a healthy carrier. Then you could have de novo mutation and there's so many other syndromes. Okay, so like this lady I was treating, I'm also a radiation oncologist with early onset breast cancer, no family history, no syndromic feature. When she developed post-radiation pigmentation, I explained to her it's because of radiation. She said, no, sir, we have this pigmentation in our family. And then her nephew showed that he had this lip pigmentation, she and her lips. So this was obviously a misdiagnosis of putz jagger syndrome. And that's why, you know, so we would have tested BRCA1 to have been negative and it was a STK11 mutation. And same like this lady I had treated many years ago who was... At 23, she had breast cancer. One, one day she came without wearing her lipstick and we saw she had this classical pigmentation. And later on, her mother and uncle developed stomach and bowel cancer, another missed diagnosis. So this is the type of cancer you get in BRCA1. Typically, these are early onset triple negative. These ages are in our own cohort. In BRCA2, little older age, they would be ER positive. In P53, much younger age, they generally HER2 positive. Then putz jagger and Lynch syndrome also about 10-15%. So this I'm just showing the burden of genetic counseling and testing, which is required in India each year. You need 75,000 people to do pre-test counseling and post-test counseling in the mutation carriers and VUS carriers in a large number of people. So you will never have enough genetic counselors in the country. So you will have to learn the basic question. In Tata Hospital, we every year we get close to 1,500 new families with hereditary cancers and a lot of patients we get. And the syndromes also, hereditary breast ovarian cancer is one of the commonest syndrome. Of course, now we have 12,000 families registered. Every year we registered 1,500 to 2,000 families. This is an old slide. So breast cancer is the most common hereditary cancer in uh, you know anywhere in the world. And this is our own Indian data. So the spectrum of cancer is typical, uh, which is early onset unilateral uh, breast or ovarian cancer. Uh, and half one third of them will have ovarian cancer. And majority of these are triple negative. So in the last one year, we started doing in-house germline NGS panel and we did over 1500. And of these, uh, we looked at mainly in most cases, 26 gene panel SOFIA with copy number analysis. So uh, 1000 cases had HBOC, suspected HBOC because they had a family history or early onset uh, breast or ovary or prostate or pancreatic cancer. We found pathogenic variant in one third of them. 
and majority of them were BRCA1, BRCA2, but you look at it there, many of them have other genes like mismatch repair, MSH2, MSH6, P53, and many other genes there. And 5% of these were copy number variants, uh, which would be, yeah, hello. Hello. Yeah, please continue, Dr. Sari. Please continue. Okay, sorry, I, I heard something. Okay. Okay, so this is a mutation spectrum. Same way in Lynch syndrome, one third, uh, more than one third are pathogenic variants. And it is not just MLH1, MSH2. Why I want to bring out that in MSH2, there's 15% to 20% risk of breast cancer and also ovarian cancer. So in STK11, like our own cohort, most of these are ER positive. Then this is, I'm just showing that uh, it's not just finding the mutation in our P53 cohort in 136 families in whom we found a mutation. We contacted the family in 140 first degree relatives we tested and half of them were mutation carriers and then again second degree. And that's very important that we go out to the next, uh, you know, uh, you know, the family members. Otherwise, just testing the patient is only half the job done. And this is what we use in our genetics clinic about genetic risk assessment. So this I'm showing about for a healthy woman. Okay, so this I will describe uh, in Tata Hospital. The Indi this is a template which we mostly use, but it is individualized for the patient age, sex and whatever other illnesses she has had. Like is a healthy, uh, these, this old healthy female her who in her family had cancer and we found a mutation and we described the mutation. So it is written as heterozygous. That means one copy is mutated. It's a pathogenic variant or a mutation and we describe it's a frame shift mutation. Then we describe that this causes autosomal dominant hereditary breast ovarian cancer syndrome. Then we describe our own cohort findings, which is over 1000 BRCA carriers and other studies. So which shows that the lifetime cancer risk in female BRCA carriers is uh, 70 to 80% for breast cancer, which is generally triple negative and starting from early 20s. For BRCA2, it is a little different, but this is I'm describing for BRCA1. 30 to 40% risk of ovarian fallopian tube, primary peritoneal cancer, mostly high-grade serous carcinoma, with this risk starting from early 30s. And then 30 to 50% risk of bilateral breast cancer at diagnosis or in subsequent years. Because patients don't understand what is metachronous or synchronous. Then for in male carriers also there is risk. We describe that and then briefly mention about that. Then we describe all this counseling was done, the breast screening we advise, which is, uh, you know, which includes breast MRI with dedicated breast coil, alternating with mammograms, especially after the age of 40, if the breast is not dense. We discuss the option of prophylactic bilateral nipple and skin sparing mastectomy with reconstruction, explain what are the pros and cons and encourage them to discuss with the breast and reconstructive surgeon. And for BRCA1, we say that there's insufficient evidence to recommend tamoxifen or other hormonal agents for chemo prevention because in BRCA1, generally they're ER negative, but for BRCA2, it's different. Uh, then ovarian cancer risk uh, uh, and prevention. So like women who have, I'll just very quickly finish, who have completed family. Uh, so we uh, discuss, specify that the limitation in ovarian cancer screening. So that's why we strongly recommend risk-reducing salpingo-frectomy. And very importantly, we tell them that wherever you do, you see it, do it in a good hospital and a good pathology department. Pathologist is as important as your surgeon. The specimen should be examined and reported using the CFIMS protocol uh, for any invasive or intraepithelial carcinoma in the ovaries, fallopian tube, and peritoneal washing. And both the sites should be labeled separately, left and right. And after RRSO, the BRCA mutation carriers, they have a 1% to 2% risk of primary peritoneal cancer. And you may do CA125 ultrasound, but the clinical utility is not yet proven. Then we also explain about the sequelae of surgical menopause at a young age. So including hot flashes, explain all them. Earlier, we used to say no HRT for those who have a BRCA1 um, uh, or 2 mutation. But now there is data to suggest that they can have uh, you know, HRT uh, at least uh, till the, uh, for a few years or maybe up to their age of natural menopause, especially if they're having distressing menopausal symptom and then for other things we discuss and then we give the advice for family and if suppose that lady has not completed family so we discuss the pre-implantation and prenatal genetic testing so this we have a detailed session with the couple 
Now, if suppose the patient already has ovarian cancer, so in those cases, you because ovarian cancer has a poor prognosis in general, we do not advise preventive mastectomy in those who have ovarian cancer. And uh, for uh, we say that even after they have surgery, they have risk of primary peritoneal cancer, so they have to have. And in ovarian cancer patients, systemic therapy option is very important because many studies have shown that use of olaparib can improve their disease control. And if they had a unilateral breast cancer, they come to us later. Very often, they after the initial surgery, they've come. We discuss the option of prophylactic contralateral mastectomy. And then again, that they should meet that. So Voltaire said, you know, perfect is the enemy of the good. Perfect is you have a very well-developed referral system. You have genetic counselors who do pre-test counseling, comprehensive testing, and post-test counseling, and everything done as it should happen in terms of prevention, screening, and precision medicine. That does not happen. But that should not prevent you all to do what is good or acceptable, which is at least patients who have a distinct possibility of having a hereditary cancer. You pick them up, you know what are the FAQs, at least the common syndrome, and do the bare minimum testing, if at all, whatever they could afford, if they could afford a comprehensive testing and employ methods which are known to reduce this. So there are many founder mutations in India, but also we have to found the common mutation. So if those who can't afford, you can test for them. Uh, I won't go into the details of this, but just to know. So we had a lot of uh, families from all over the country and our family members are also in different parts of the country. So I would want people in all parts of the country to become expert in managing these families because our patient whom we identify as their sisters and nieces or brothers may be living in your city. So you can guide them and help them uh, you know, do that. We were lucky to have funding from ICMR and DBT through which we have now more than 12,000 families from whom we have learned and we try to help them. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sareen, for that uh, uh, extensive talk uh, covering most of the things related to the topic. Uh, sorry, my last our... part, my screen was shared or not? Uh, sorry, I just saw it. That. was, it was, it was throughout. Okay. Perfectly. Uh, we come to the final segment, which is Q&A, and uh, what I have done is I have taken the questions from the chat Q&A and some on the YouTube uh, and compiled them together here for our examiners. Uh, so if we can also have Dr. Ditendra Sarkar uh, back with his video. And, yeah. And, yeah. So what I've done is I have uh, alternated these questions for you and Dr. Sareen, uh, and maybe we can start with the first one, which is for Dr. Ditendra Sarkar. If prophylactic mastectomy shows occult primary, on final histopathology, I assume. Uh, axillary shape staining should be done? Uh, yes. How? The answer to the question is very simple. Yes, axillary evaluation should be done. Right. Uh, so uh, you mean by... Biopsy, central limb node biopsy. So you said primary mean invasive primary. Yeah. So invasive primary after a mastectomy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Axillary evaluation should be done. Right. Uh, I'll come to the second question, which is uh, if a patient has had breast conservation surgery and a adjuvant RT, uh, and then the patient gets diagnosed with a BRCA mutation, uh, would a completion mastectomy be beneficial? Uh, to so this is a common scenario when they come to us, they've already had by the time genetic testing, someone thinks of it, genetic testing is ordered, report comes, and they have the counseling. They've already had a BCT with RT. So in that setting, we tell them we'll just follow up uh, closely because, because of radiation as such, the contralateral new primary risk is reduced, but it may be higher than what is otherwise. So we, uh, and we, because now they'll be followed up with MRI also, MRI alternating with that. But if suppose she had come to me before radiation has been given, then if it is a T1 N0, where otherwise if a mastectomy radiation may have been avoided, in that case, you say, you give them an option of, ipsilateral completion mastectomy and contralateral prophylactic mastectomy. So this is one of the options that is given to them. Uh, we come to our third question, which is uh, for Dr. Dipendra Sarkar. Uh, contrast mammogram uh, versus uh, MRI breast. Are these two tests totally unrelated? Are they complementary? Are they comparable? Uh, any experience from you, sir? Uh, I don't have the evidence or the data to give a conclusive uh, uh, statement to this. But having mm -hmm. said that, uh, we, uh, we are more uh, prone to using MRI and 
MRI has got its advantages that it's not only about the enhancement, the non-mass enhancement, but far more important is the kinetic curve. So it's, it's more of a problem solving and far more important is MRI can also be a good assessor of how the response is. So I don't, uh, I won't be able to give you any evidence, but for as of date, I would prefer to use MRI in appropriate cases. So I think MRI is the standard for young women and it is alternating MR, alternating with MRI if the breast is not very dense. So because, you know, some micro cals could be picked up on a, on a mammogram. So that's what it is. So the next question for me is how many degrees of relatives to be tested in a female comes positive or BRCA? So I think we may, that's where the pedigree becomes very handy. So we look all first, first degrees. And if suppose first degree, the sister is also a carrier, then only her children when they become, because the other question is what age? If it is BRCA1, then after the age of 20, if it is a P53, even at the age of 5. So depending at what age they get the cancer. Suppose the sister is found to be carrier, then only her children will be tested at an appropriate age. But if the sister is not a carrier, obviously her children would not be tested. So that is how we trace the, and then one by one on the pedigree, you see, first you test and then you go ahead. So I think you already touched upon the last question, which is... Yes, uh, yes. I yeah. covered that question, yeah, because it right. is related to that. So I think we have just one question left, is and which is, how does the insurance landscape appear regarding genetic consults, testing, and treatments? And I think it's open to both the examiners. Yeah, the, I, I mean, that's a tricky situation. And um, as of now, um, if it's a germline mutation is positive, the insurance will raise all its issues. Uh, regarding somatic, uh, as of now, but you have to once it's it goes to the insurance company as a BRCA positive by any means, they would refuse it. But however, you have to explain once again back that it's a somatic testing and your note has to be very clear cut differentiating what is a somatic and what is a germline because you are not expecting a genetic scientist sitting at the insurance company who is going to go through the claim and decide finally. However, I must confess at this point of time that this is an evolving science. And once we have a better roadmap and more data available, we would be able to argue in favor of the patients in, in terms of expanding the scope of insurance coverage in gene positive individuals. So one more question has come in the q and I'll just read out. It's a very important question. Dr. Mansi Mundada has asked. How do you address a situation wherein the proband is suffering from CA breast detected at 30 years with family history of breast and ovarian malignancy in last two generations, but no mutation detected in comprehensive gene panel and MLPA? Okay. So how, first of all, when you say comprehensive, was it truly comprehensive where what is done? So the first, let me see the adequacy of testing. If suppose I am very convinced that uh, it was a proper uh, test when the test was done, okay? Sometimes you repeat a test in another lab with different method. If that, was, that is also negative, then also you, I will tell them that I strongly suspect your cancer and the cancer is your, in your families of the hereditary or genetic type. So far, we have not been able to identify the mutation in any specific gene, but based on your family history, other you and your family members should have screening for HBOC. And the question comes when a preventive surgery is to be done, you know, like RRSO. So that you could discuss if there are many ovarian cancer cases also, then I would not hesitate in even recommending RRSO. Uh, but many times in such cases, later on, when we repeated genetic testing, we found a mutation. Uh, if I, if I'm allowed to take yeah. this note from Dr. Sarin, now yeah. the point he validly raised is adequacy of testing. Now what is happening is that every Tom, Dick, Harry now is investing in something called a genetic testing. Mm -hmm. Now one has to understand the informations that they hire is mostly from what has been done in the West from MyDad or some other company. They claim that they are doing NGS, but this is not truly a comprehensive testing. It's a sort of modified hotspot testing that they do. And naturally you will have many false negative and therefore the importance what uh, Dr. Sarin is doing I must re-emphasize the great job in building up an India data and mm -hmm. all concerned stakeholders must invest in building up an Indian data 
or else what the companies are doing in commercially available companies are basically doing a hotspot, which is not truly a comprehensive uh, genetic analysis. No, some of the companies are doing a very good job, but you know, despite some that, good, but, some are, good. Yeah, but, some so, but there's so many of them are coming up, you will not know. Some clinicians, okay, how many genes you test? So it's a very complex thing. You know, like sometimes when the MRI had just come, you know, someone asked which sequence to do as long as it was T1, T2, you know, that was okay. The moment it became into the multi-parametric MRI and you ask which kind of uh, PET CT to be done, FDG PET we know, but the moment, so same way genetic testing is even more complex. So, but for the sake of our patients, we have to learn. And when you have a strong clinical diagnosis, do not accept a negative report on its face value. That is what I would say. Like in a breast lump, if you are very strongly suspicion of the cancer in a postmenopausal women, just because the FNAC or core biopsy is negative, you would not accept it. Same is true for you know genetic testing. Yeah, you know, you you are just going to get a sequence of nucleic acid, yeah. nothing yeah. more than that. So yeah. it is A T T T G G G T A T A T A T. So yeah. how you interpret, unless you don't know which is normal, yeah. how would you actually understand that there is a deviation? And to understand the deviations, you need more and more data. And that's where uh, Dr. Sarin's work would be a standalone work for the country. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, thank you both our examiners for so patiently going through all the questions uh, on the chat as well as on the Q&A and being so patient with our uh, examinees also. Uh, before I uh, hand over mic to uh, uh, Dr. S.V.S. Deo for his uh, remarks, uh, on today's session, I would invite both our examiners to give their assessment of our examinees, uh, which is also an integral part of uh, how we do things uh, at the master class, uh, to assess their both uh, knowledge as well as their uh, presentation skills. Uh, uh, first, we'll hear from the, our moderator, Dr. Uh, uh, Dipin Sarkar, and then from Dr. Sareen. I, I would put uh, eight out of 10 for both of you. I mean, you were very good. Brilliant. I mean, I didn't know the amount of genetics that you know at this point. I am sure my daughter knows better computer and better WhatsApp than me. That's what I understand. So I am sure you know better genetics. So if I, I, if I am allowed to mark you, I would place eight out of 10. There are small segments where you do have confusions, which I'm sure you are going to clear as time progresses. Yeah, I would agree with Dr. Sarkar. So I think you all are ready to deal with patients who have possible inherited predisposition. You knew uh, when to ask for genetic testing and uh, how to take the genetic testing report into account. What I would suggest that uh, more of don't uh, underestimate your clinical skills and clinical history because it all starts from there. Okay. It might look very fancy, oh, you do genetic testing. Genetic testing came much later. The, the syndrome was described much before the BRCA genes were found and surgeons were dealing with it. Okay, So that is one aspect. I'll tell you how I got interested into gen this genetics. You know, Dr. Sakar was mentioning. I, was, I did my MD from Tata Hospital, went to UK for four or five years, came back and joined as a consultant in 96. When I came back, suddenly I found hereditary cancer, breast cancer is very common in India. I said, what could have happened in four or five years that this cancer is, you know, we get it. So previously I was to find one case in few months. Now every week I was finding. Later I realized the only thing had changed being in UK for a few years. The way I was taking history had changed. And before I could revert to my, like in driving, before I could revert to my Indian style of taking history, I started picking up these cases. So history, the way you take history is very important. You ask an open question. We directly ask, did your mother or aunt or sister had breast cancer? So paternal inheritance is lost. Mother may not like the case he showed. The mother was unaffected, but the maternal aunt was affected. So, and give them time to think at least 30 seconds. So you suddenly out of the blue, someone asks you, you may not even to answer this question. They are not come prepared for this question. So I think history is very important and not both of you and other trainees. So I think your clinical skills, which include history taking is the most important thing. And then comes genetic testing and then comes guidelines based on which you can manage. And of course, precision medicine, which is now driving all this genetic testing. So Ola Parib, the AstraZeneca people have been the biggest driver of driving force for genetic testing now. Thank you.
Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I invite our uh, president-elect, Dr. Vesvias Dev, uh, for his remarks, uh, sir. Hi, thank you, Srijan. Uh, it was a wonderful masterclass. Uh, having Dr. Rajiv Sharin and Deepnand, I thoroughly enjoyed last one hour. I really don't know how would the time fly. It was a fantastic masterclass on a very important topic, the inaugural masterclass of the ISO uh, for students. I think it was really great. And uh, I would like to say, I think breast cancer is one of the leading fields where I think it laid foundations for most of the innovations in oncology starting from multimodality treatment, organ conservations, genetics, risk reductions. I think this is the leading field. You can learn a lot from breast cancer and translate into other solid tumors. For the sake of, I think, Dr. Rajiv Sarin, I would consider he's one of the, I can, we can call him the father of uh, breast cancer <laughs> genetics in India. So <laughs> we learn a lot. And uh, now, it is, now it is almost mainstream into clinical practice. So it is no more a topic of research. It is no more a topic for theory questions. Every day in clinic, you have to be really aware. We do this every day in and day out. Every clinic, as Dr. Rajiv Sarin has said, the, it is the mindset. If you start thinking about genetic cancers, you will start finding them in your clinic. It is how you practice, how you take your history, how you document your cases. Every day, I think two to three patients, now we are coming across. And the most challenging decisions, surgical decision making is becoming more challenging of all the solid tumors in breast cancer. For each case to take a surgical decision nowadays, it takes almost 20 to 30 minutes. Gone are the days just to discuss between MRM and BCS. So that is why it is very critical for all residents and trainees to understand the basics of uh, breast cancer genetics. You have to practice them in your clinical practice, the clinical skills you should acquire, and know the nuances of genetic testing. That's what our experts have highlighted. What are the drawbacks, how to test them, how to interpret. It is not like ordering a blood test or MRI or a PET scan. It has a lot of implications, therapeutic implications, social implications, psychological implications. So take it very seriously. If you order a test, you interpret a test, and if you are pre-test counseling are extremely important, you have to make it a habit. You cannot depend on genetic counselors because you have a lot of shortage of these trained people. So the clinicians have to take a role of the clinical, especially the, 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 the genetic counseling part. And coming to risk reductions, I think we have a fantastic discussions, various case scenarios, various options. It is always, it is not a decision which is imposed by the treating physician. You always educate your patient. There will be back and forth discussions. Then you arrive at a final management plan. Genetic testing and interventions is a process. It is not a one-time intervention. You test and you decide on one day. So you have to make a habit of how to deal with the families, how to deal with the patients. Communication is extremely important. You should not scare them, but you have to empower them, give them knowledge, and slowly you arrive at a final treatment or management plan. So you need to imbibe all these qualities when you embark on this field. And I'm sure our experts have really done a great job today. And I would like to thank the ISO leadership. Dr. Das is here. Dr. Rao for spearheading this masterclass. And of course, Dr. Sijan, last but not the least, who has done a fantastic job. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, this is all from us uh, today from the Academic Council of ISO. Wish everyone a very good evening. And thank you for logging in. We'll see you again the next fortnight, Tuesday now, not Thursdays. Just the next Tuesday after next. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.